Okay, let's go back. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. I will give power, Jesus says, unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. Look at this. This supports this three and a half thing again. A thousand, two hundred, and three score days. One thousand, two hundred, and sixty days. You know, a biblical month is actually 30 days. One biblical month is 30 days. And how that's proven is if you look at the book of Genesis with Noah, when the rain fell down and the waters were abated, and you compare the days with the months it gives, it shows 30 days equals one month. All right, so I'm not going to really get into that right now. So that study is proven in my teaching on beginner's discipleship on the tribulation. I went through every verse trying to explain that to you, so I'm not going to do that here. Okay, so basically, 1,260 days, that's 30 days, okay? 30 days equals one month. What does that equal? Three and a half years, that's what you're going to find out. Ah, then it makes sense even more that these two witnesses are coming down at that timeline. See that? So that uh, supports it even more. All right, let's go back to the two witnesses over here. So they prophesy 1,203 score. So a score, for some of you who don't know, that's tw uh, 20. So 3 times 20 is 60. Hence, we get 1,260 days. Clothed in sackcloth. Ah, notice right here, they're clothed in sackcloth. They're in mourning over here. So whoever who these two are, they're in mourning. Why are they wearing sackcloth in mourning? One possible reason is this, okay? If you look at Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, it talks about once the abomination of desolation occurs, all of a sudden these two witnesses come, right? There's something that happened within that abomination of desolation that caused them to wear the sackcloth. Look back at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Something happened. It's what? The Jews are being persecuted. Their own people. That's why they're in mourning. Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 15. Verse 15. Notice, remember this passage? The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in Jerusalem, right? We read that. The very next verse, look at verse 16. The very next verse, what happens? Then... Let them be which, in, which flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And what? Whoa. Whoa. See, sorrow, sackcloth, mourning, sadness unto them that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days. Look at that. So we see right here, we can see why they're dressed up in sackcloth during this time. Because the Jews, their own people are being slaughtered, persecuted. And I showed you at Revelation chapter 6, human sacrifices for the Antichrist. Cannibalism is spreading. Interesting note, which religion believes in eating the body and drinking the blood? The Roman Catholic Church. And I showed you at Revelation 6, the Antichrist is a what? He's a pope. What's his bride, his city? Babylon, which is Rome. And we're going to see that later on in Revelation 17, 18. Something connected here. All right, let's go back to Revelation 11. <clears throat> Revelation 11. All right, you didn't fill out the names, Pastor. Who are these two witnesses? All right, still fill in the blank. Let's figure them out. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Whoever these two witnesses are, they're known as two olive trees. That's what they're called. And they're known as two candlesticks. Now, there's a recent trend that's going on where people try to act smart and claim that this is referring to Jews and Gentiles. Uh, no, okay, no. 
because it says literally two witnesses at verse 3. Did you look up two witnesses throughout your Bible, what that means? Two individuals. Yeah. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Yeah. So just look up throughout the Bible, what do you think it means by two witnesses? Not only that, if you think that's referring to Gentiles, then what are you going to do with verse 2? The Gentiles are trotting it underfoot. Mm -hmm. See, so you can't say that. So uh, a lot of people online, they just want to make a name, act smart. Don't do that, okay? Some Bible believers too, okay? Look, we know how much of the Bible you know. You don't have to act like you're smart and try to put out something new that, oh, look at me, and you get attention. I really don't like that. That's something you have to be careful of. Right. So the thing is this, is that as Bible believers... What's very important, I do believe in progressive revelation, advanced revelation, but it does scare me that, you know, you're just shy in the ministry and then you spit out this kind of new stuff. Especially, with, uh, especially if some of those Bible believers, they get 90%, if not 99% of their learning from Dr. Ruckman. Uh -huh. and, then, and then they start to correct things and add new things. That's some, that means that, what, you're smarter than him or something? It kind of scares me. Me, I don't claim to be smarter than Larkin. I don't, be cla I don't claim to be smarter than Ruckman. Or even, I don't even claim to be smarter than the Bible-believing preachers you saw at our blowout. That's your pastor. And I really mean that. I know that I put a lot of stuff online, but I don't think like that. You might say, why don't you think like that? Because it's dangerous. Yeah, I know good. myself. Yeah. 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 That's good. Right. So that's why you Bible believers have to be very careful, especially you onliners. You're carrying on a fantasy and throwing stuff, and then you just fight and nitpick over the silliest things. Yep. Got to avoid that. Yep. You got to realize this. With your knowledge being a Bible believer, you're already controversial enough. Yeah. You're already split enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to make it further. Okay. But anyway, two olive trees, two candlesticks who stand before the God of the earth. They stand before him. So then, this man, who's, who is a very humble person and is one of the greatest prophets in the world, thinks that it's referring to himself, which is Joseph Smith, and referring to, uh, it's referring to the Bible and Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon. These are the two witnesses. Why? Because Joseph Smith is a very humble man, you know. So his book is one of the most humblest, greatest books in the world. No, it's... Balarkey, actually. He plagiarized from the King James Bible. Yeah. In fact, you'll notice in his uh, passages, he actually plagiarized chapters. Yeah, chapters. All right? That's worse than the Quran. All right? He plagiarized chapters. You're saying the Quran plagiarized too? Yeah, it plagiarized too. You know why? Both of them, both of them had a same mindset. Yeah. They had the same sexual problem. Sick, right? They also had the same pride issue. Muhammad and Joseph Smith, man, they both shared the same devil somewhere. Yeah, they got the same father, that's why. All righty. But anyways, enough of bashing them. Let's find out the two olive trees and the two candlesticks then. It becomes pretty obvious. All you have to do is completely have a non-biased mindset. Blank slate. All right? Just a blank slate. Let's find out the two candlesticks and two olive trees. Now, with your previous Bible knowledge of all the biblical characters you can think about, think about the biblical characters who would fit in the following passages. It's that simple. Yeah. All right, you ready? Let's do this, okay? Let's do this. The I mystery. And think about your previous Bible knowledge of the biblical characters. And think who would fit here, okay? And if any man will hurt them. So... Remember, these Gentiles, the Antichrist people, they take over Jerusalem, right? So they're going to try to hurt these two witnesses. And this is really neat. Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. So notice, fire comes out from their mouth, consumes the Antichrist army. And that's going to be cool. I remember that, yeah, I said cool. So Brother Jack's all good. It's cool, right? <laughs> But I remember Dr. Upman's Adlib commentary he has in Revelation where they're inside the Jerusalem temple. They're holding a sex orgy, cannibalism, and dancing to the, the contemporary music. And the Antichrist is cackling. The false prophet is sh giving out the blood to, for the people to drink. 
And all of a sudden, these two witnesses come down, and one of them quotes the Ten Commandments. And then the false prophet opens his mouth like this. And then one of the witnesses says, you better shut your mouth, boy, before a fly goes in it. <laughs> and, then one of, and then one of these uh, Baalite priests or these uh, Catholic ecumenical New World Order uh, officers, come, uh, pastors come up and say, these men are not from God. These men are not from God. You know Mike from one of the contemporary rock musicians? Maybe Lady Gaga or something. And then the person doesn't want to hand him over the mic. And one of the witnesses bashed that person on the teeth, grabbed the mic from the person. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about. I wrote the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and, then he was, and then he was preaching at them. And, he, and then he was saying, you bunch of hell-bound, rotten, Christ-rejecting, God-forsaking sinners! Repent! And then all the all and then the soldiers they get all mad and then here comes these you know ecumenical new world order liberal loving socialist pe soldiers coming in and trying to arrest these two witnesses and then they just don't even give them the time of day by saying you know uh, I'm being persecuted for Jesus' sake so I'm not gonna shoot you and yeah. you know you can persecute me I'm gonna show you love from the gospel be nice no that those days are over they just go <laughs> burn them up. <laughs> Oh, you can't be a Christian doing like that. And then probably one of the witnesses get mad at, at that person and go, <laughs> burns that person up just for saying that, man. Oh, pastor, you're just so mean. Why are you laughing at? No, God showed you enough love and grace. It's time that every time you mocked his name, he gets his payment. Justice has to be served. Your toler tolerating your mockery, laughter in street preaching has gone on long enough. So then, man, that's going to be quite a scene, right? That's going to be quite a scene, man. So then, think about it. What character in the Bible was able to call down fire from heaven and burn the enemies? Elijah, right? You saw Elijah calling down fire from heaven. Well, okay, let's just keep reading. These have power to shut heaven. So they shut off the heaven, the skies, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. During the time that the days they're on there to prophesy to the people, rain's not going to pour. Wait a minute. Three and a half years they're down there, right? They shut off the rain during that timeline of three and a half years. What biblical character in your Bible was able to shut off rain during the timeline of three and a half years? Elijah again. See, the Bible's showing it to you. And have, uh, verse 6, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Wait, what biblical character in your Bible was able to turn water into blood? Moses. Keep reading, verse 6. And to smite the earth with all plagues. So they smite, they hit the earth with all sorts of plagues, as often as they will, whenever they want. Notice it says smite too, right? As if you're hitting something. Yeah, come on. Like you're using some object to cause the plague. What biblical character most often used this object to smite things to cause the plagues throughout the land? Moses. Moses. Smite the rod, right? How about that? Okay, so we have our answer. Do you, you don't need more than that. You just need that chapter alone. And you find out the two witnesses. You don't have to pretend you're smart and go deep and say, this is referring to Gentiles and Jews of the two olive tree, two candlesticks. Stop, man. Just stop. All right? You don't have to show off more than God's showing. What, you think you're smarter than God? God already showed it to you simply. You don't have to show off your knowledge and try to be even better than God. I don't like that. So it's pretty obvious right over here that's referring to Moses and Elijah. But let's look at scripture with scripture to support this. Will there be a Moses and will there be Elijah who has some kind of role in the tribulation? Look at the book of Malachi. Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. 
Notice what the Bible says at verse 4, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. So we see the identities of these two witnesses more and more. They are undoubtedly Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. It was proven within the same context of Revelation 11. And then we're also going to look at Malachi chapter 4. The word of God reads, remember ye the law of what? Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you who? Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before God actually comes down at the end of the tribulation, he's going to make sure to send Elijah beforehand. And then he mentioned another name. He told them during the timeline when Elijah comes down, they got to remember the law of who? Moses. So there's no doubt that these two people are the crucial play. Some people will say that, well, you know, Moses died, so he doesn't qualify. Well, like I told you before, where's, did, where did the Bible say that has to be the qualification? It never said that. By the way, here's something that's interesting. Moses, yes, he died. But you got to realize this, him and Elijah still shared a very strong similarity. You know what it was? It was different from Enoch. What was different from Enoch is that Moses and Elijah had people trying to search their bodies, but they couldn't find them. That's, really good. That's what the Bible texts say. Mm -hmm. Enoch, it didn't say that people were trying to search for his body after that. No, it was only Moses and Elijah. Look at the book of Deuteronomy. I got the look, look at the book of Deuteronomy. Look at the last chapter of Deuteronomy. The last chapter of Deuteronomy. Man, this, this must have been quite a scene for Moses, actually, at Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. Man, I just love Dr. Rutman's Adler commentary. Sometimes he has those dramatic moments, you know, where they're fighting the Antichrist and those touching moments. He had Moses' story like really touching where it was just him and God going up hand in hand up the mountain. So Moses, who was so bombarded with people, people doing great miracles and plagues, seeing Pharaoh and all that, finally had his alone time with God and he died uh, having his alone time with God up there. So that must have been quite an ending, right? Imagine ending your life like that, like away from everybody, and you're up on top of the mountaintop with God. Man, that's got to be quite a touching scene. Amen, quite a touching scene. Man. We're going to look at verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Look what God did. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. See that? No one could find his body. They tried to find it, but they couldn't find his body. Now notice that Revelation chapter 11, and then we'll read the latter part of verse 4. The latter part of verse 4. The two witnesses stand before the God of the earth, right? Stand before God. You're going to find out scriptures also support this with Moses and Elijah. They're the ones who stood before God. All right, let's go to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus chapter 33. Two passages, Exodus 33 and 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17 and Exodus 33. Exodus 33. And 1 Kings 17. Notice that Moses and Elijah undoubtedly stood before the God of the earth. 1 Kings 17 and Exodus 33. All right, look what Moses did with God. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. The Bible says, And he said, God speaking to Moses, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. So Moses standing. Where? Where God's going to be present. Verse 22. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, 
and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So notice that Moses stood before God. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse 1. Verse 1. Notice what Elijah said, that he stood before God. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Haab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. See that? He's standing before God as well. So no doubt that we see that it is clearly Moses and Elijah. Not Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon and the Bible. That is ridiculous. It's not uh, Enoch and Elijah. Neither is it this weird new thing that came out with Jews and Gentiles, etc. All right, let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. So we see right here that this is going to be quite a scenery where the Jews are definitely going to get their two. They're going to get huge support from these two witnesses. And then if Revelation 10 is true, where I talked about that Jesus will show his appearance to them, or when we jump to Revelation 12 later on, some kind of hero figure or a savior figure might show up later on, these Jews are going to get a lot of backup. You know why? Because they're versing against the satanic trinity. They're going to need all the help that they can get. 